Well, good morning. All right, we're trying again. Good morning. Or good morning. How would, how, which one's the best tone for that, the inflection for that? Which one works best? It is great to see you. We're glad you're here. Uh, come on in and grab a seat as you're making your way in. Um, just if you're a, a guest or a regular tender, grab one of those communication cards if you need anything and let us know. Uh, or some of the people that have a, a badge on, I forgot mine this morning actually, but it says, how can I help? Just scan that code and they can get you to the information that you need. Just want to let you know about a few things going on. First of all, I want to welcome our youth band who is here today to uh, lead us in worship. They do a great job. I've stuck my head in down in the youth department a few times and they do a great job. We're looking forward to having them up here this morning. Um, just a few things to know. Next Sunday is the uh, holiday luncheon. Uh, the ex deadline was extended to that through today. So if you haven't signed up for the seniors' holiday luncheon, you can still do that uh, as of uh, through today. And so give Jim Henry a call or just call the church. Even if nobody's here, leave a message and we'll get that to him. Uh, also, women's Christmas dinner tickets went on sale today. And so I think there are still some tickets left for that. So if you will uh, see Cricket or somebody in the women's ministry office, uh, you can get that uh, ticket or buy a table or whatever you'd like today. That's coming up on December the 8th. Um, the new members luncheon is today for those of you that are, are new members. Uh, but it is also for anyone who's just interested in membership. If you just want to hear more about it, uh, you're welcome to come today. It's down in the gathering place, which is in the uh, gymnasium building up on the second floor. Uh, so come on down there after church. We would love to have you. Even if you didn't sign up, uh, we would be glad to have you down there for that. Uh, just some holiday events. The Student Ministries Thanksgiving Feast is coming up November 16th. Uh, and then the Thanksgiving Eve Soup Supper is here Wednesday night, November 23rd. That's something that we've done for a long time, but in particular, uh, what we've done the last couple of years is just a gathering, have dinner, and then just people share blessings and different things that have happened in their life. Now, we uh, at some point, uh, hopefully in the near future, are going to have a new senior pastor coming, and he's going to have a lot of names to learn. And, uh, you know, around 800 or so different people, he's going to have to figure out who they are. And here's what's going to happen is he's going to get a call one morning and they're going to say, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is Sister Sally or, you know, Brother Harry or whoever. And, uh, you know, I met you at that party the other night and he's going to be, ooh, who is that? You know, and, and he's going to jump on the computer and he's going to start, you know, and find that person's name. And this is what he's going to see. And that's not going to be very helpful, okay? And uh, so uh, let me encourage you to head over to the fellowship hall uh, at some point, or just, you can just send in a picture, get your picture made so we can update the directory. And families and people change. Take the classy family, for instance. You know, this is a, a beautiful picture of the classy family, but perhaps they've changed a little bit, and he may not recognize all of them as they've, as they've grown up. I think uh, Nathaniel's at least a foot and a half taller in this picture than he was, was then. But we would encourage you to come and get your picture made so we can get our directory updated. Now let's worship the Lord. Awesome. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul makes a stunning statement emphasizing how important Jesus' re resurrection is to a Christian worship. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Praise God that we have a Savior who lives. Let's stand and praise him together.
an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son, God, um, and those who will hear will live. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me an eternal life, he does not come into judgment, but has path, passed from death to life.
God, you're creator of all things. You're a king of all kings and lord of all lords, rulers of all people, ruler of all people. You are father to the fatherless. You are the healer of those who are sick. You are the king of peace. And at the same time, you are the God of thunder. You are God of all gods, Lord of all lords, provider to your people and nothing but good to us. We praise you and we thank you for who you are. Lord, your word says, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. And you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. And God, you ask us to bring requests to you and to look to you. And so we do. God, thank you for those in our midst who have served this country for their sacrifice and their time. I pray that you would heal and be with them and their families. God, we have some needs in the church. I pray specifically for Darlene Marino, for Marley for Sally Peebles, for Marcy Hackler, for Mike Hughes. God, please be with the Marino family. They have lost an enormous loss. Would you be with them in the midst of darkness and sadness and trial and struggle, and would you bring them peace by your Holy Spirit? God, we pray for those who would take your word wherever you would send it. We pray for Jeff and Katie Saunders. We pray for Ron Mann. And we pray for Arise to Read here in our own city. God, would you provide the things they need just at the right time? Would you prove yourself to the people who serve and who pray? Would you lift up your name and draw men and women to your son? And would you do this for your glory and for their joy? Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are your judgments and how inscrutable your ways, O oh Lord. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that it might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand. Praise the one who has rescued us.
Please be seated. Here comes the second wave, <laughs> the balcony wave, that's great. You know, one of the uh, things that was really neat seeing the, the youth band up here and stuff, you know, occasionally I'll hear somebody say something like, well, well, that's the church of tomorrow, you know, no, it's not, it's the church of today. We're all the church of today, you know, whether we're little kids running stomping across the air conditioner grates over there on their way down and uh, or whether it's a youth band or whether it's a 90 year old in the room or, or somebody in a nursing home watching online we're, we're the church of today uh, it, it takes all of us and that's some of what we're going to talk about today I want to apologize in advance if I seem to have my nose and my notes and my head down a little bit because I'm well aware that if I start ad-libbing today we're in trouble and so uh we need to, to move through this. We have a lot to do. The next 42 minutes is going to be kind of weird and a little bit strange and different from our normal fare. Um, I'm, we're going, I'm going to preach a little bit, and then we're going to respond, and then I'm going to preach a little more, and then we'll respond again, and, and that's just how we're going to do today. There's a couple of things that are converging on today. One of those is that back on the 23rd of October, we had the celebration of grace service. And in that, uh, the session acknowledged, hey, we can do better in this whole area of shepherding. So we're going to try to talk practically a little bit about what that looks like and about what that means today. Uh, so we're going to really talk about the shepherding side. And then a couple of times a year, we have a membership Sunday. That's on today as well. But we're going to talk sort of about the flock. So we're going to talk about the shepherds and the flock. We're going to welcome some new members. We're going to affirm our corporate commitment uh, to what it is to be a member of First of Ann and uh, ask ourselves, do we really mean it? What is it we're, con we're, what is it we're uh, confessing in that? And what do, do we really mean it when we say it? So let me pray and then let's get started. Father, we are grateful that uh, all of us together make up uh, the church. Those of us who know Jesus Christ, whether we're you know, five years old or, or whether we're a uh, hundred years old, we are your body and uh, we are one body, the body of Christ. And so we celebrate that and we want to especially acknowledge that we're one body with differing roles, but we are one body together in Christ today. And we thank you for that. Guide us through this process. Help us learn. Help us have a little uh, conviction and a little encouragement as we go through this today. In Jesus' name, amen. Be finding Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to be there. You might want to stick, uh, just grab an offering envelope, stick it in there, take that envelope home with you, fill it up, bring it back. Um, we're going to have that, uh, uh, but we're all going to come back to Ephesians 4 in a little bit, uh, so you might want to hold that place. But we're going to jump around to several different texts. I'm not normally a topical preaching type, but uh, we are going to do that for the most part today. But there's a fundamental principle that we need to nail down right at the very beginning, right as we get started, a principle about who we are. We are each members of one body, okay? Now that seems, you know, you say, well, that obviously, of course we are. But the fact of the matter is elders, deacons, staff members that are church members, new members being that we're going to introduce today, members who have been here for 50 years, homebound members who can't be here today, we are one body. You know, uh, look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. It says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I really like the way the New Living Translation puts that. It says, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. 
He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing, full of love. When we speak in terms of shepherds and flock, we are not talking about two independent entities. You know, sometimes org charts, sometimes, you know, graphs and things can be a little bit misleading. And sometimes subtly and subconsciously, we, we can develop a little bit of an us and them mentality. That we're two separate groups. We're not really all the same. But the fact is, it's one group. We have different roles within that group, but it's one, we are one body together. One group, one body, elders, deacons, staff, members yet to be labeled. We are all one body together with many parts each with its own special work. We need to remember that and not lose sight of that. There is no us and them. There is no they. Well, I guess there's a they to some degree. I remember when my kids wanted to do something here one time that needed executive permission at the church. They said, do you think they will let us do that? I said, who do you think they is when it comes to that? <laughs> and so, of course they will, you know, but, but most of the, for the most part, there's not a they there's not this sense of there's this group over here, there's this group over here. We are one body together, and that's something we really have to celebrate and something we really have to drive into our hearts and minds. Within this one body, though, point number two, within this one body, some are called to shepherd. And so the first part of this, we're going to talk about shepherds. We're going to talk about the shepherding aspect. All that we've said about being one body, that there's not individual bodies within it, there, even though there, we are one body, that doesn't mean that there are no lines of authority and that there are no hierarchies within that one body, that there is no leadership structure within that body because there certainly is. Within these roles are aspects of authority and leadership structures and care where responsibilities have been given to certain entities within that one body that are not given to everyone within that body. And we need to understand a few things about that. First is that it's an act of God. It's an act of God. Ephesians 4, jump back there again, verses 11 and 12, a little before what we just read, says, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors can be shepherds as well, that, that work can be shepherds, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. You know, we elect our shepherds here, and do we have absolute insurance that we never make a mistake in that process? No, we can't have absolute assurance of that. But listen, we have got to accept and we've got to trust that God is ultimately superintending the process. If not, we lose all faith. We lose all faith in, 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 the, in the design and God's plan for the church and the whole structure that God has put in place of the church. Yes, we can make mistakes. Yes, we can get things wrong. But on the big picture, on the grand scale, we have to have a sense that God is superintending this. God is leading, God is directing, God is calling out, God is placing his hand on. Not people to be a separate entity, but people to have a different role within that body. Secondly, we need to understand that is serious business. And let me really direct this to the shepherds among us here, those who are elders in our church. 1 Peter chapter 5, jump over there real quick. 1 This shepherding is very serious. Peter writes in verse 1 of chapter 5, he says, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Elders are called to be shepherds, exhorted by Peter to shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. 
That's a tall command. That's something we have to look at and take very seriously. Let me a couple of observations. Number one is that the flock is God's. The flock is God's. The flock does not belong to the shepherds. The flock belongs to God. We're also called the bride of Christ. One of the things that uh, Ronnie said one time, somebody was talking about something with the church, and, and uh, he said, uh, you know, people need to be real, real careful about treating the bride of Christ like their mistress. Boy, that was a powerful statement. And it's so easy to do that sometimes, that we begin to look at the bride of Christ and, and treat it like our personal mistress, whether we're a leader or whether we're a member within that body. You know, saying the words, my church, that's not wrong. Actually, that's a good thing when we talk about my church. My church did this, my church did that. But we need to be careful that that phrase is a phrase that we use for identification, not for possession. Because it's not my church in terms of ownership. It's not my church in my church in sense of possession. It is my church in the sense of identification, in the sense of belonging. And I love it when I hear people say, well, at my church... Because there's a certain sense of, of acceptance and, and of, of belonging in that. But then I also hear people say, well, at my church, that's different altogether. The same words don't always mean the same thing, do they? Second thing is the flocks need care. Flocks need care. He uses the word oversight. Now, let's be honest. We don't really like this sheep analogy very much, do we? It's a little bit degrading. It's a bit demeaning. It's not something that we really like to be called sheep. But it's biblical. Maybe a little offensive to us in our, in our human nature, but it's biblical. You know, we can't just take the good phrases used for us. I am a child of God and a sheep. I am a joint heir with Christ. And a sheep. A royal priesthood. And a sheep. We can't get away from that sheep part. We are sheep. He uses that over and over. Shepherds are for sheep. Shepherd, though, doesn't mean manager. Shepherds are not called to manage the lives of the sheep. They are called to be involved and engaged. What, are, what do shepherds really do? Well, just kind of to condense it down a little bit, let me give you a real quick version of what shepherds do, what they do for the sheep. They feed them, lead them, meet them, and protect them. Feed them, lead them, meet them, and protect them. What does it mean? Well, first of all, shepherds are responsible to feed the sheep. Now, that may come in a lot of different ways, and our primary food is the Word of God. Now, that comes in different forms. Every shepherd is not a Buddy Jones or a Mickey Bowden or a shepherd who can get up in front of a group of people and teach a Bible study. Every shepherd's not necessarily capable of doing that. And some people say, well, I'm not a teacher. I can't get up and teach. That is not required for a person to be an elder, for a person to be a shepherd. But feeding those you have oversight of, those you've been given care of, feeding them the word of God is part of it. But for some, that's going to come in more informal settings. That's going to come sitting at a table, talking through an issue, and the primary factor of instruction in that is God's word, not personal opinion. The primary, the primary factor in the instruction of that is not just the, the wisdom of the world, but it's the word of God being imparted, even in those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Not everybody is an upfront teacher. Not every elder is an upfront teacher. That's not the point. The point is the ability to communicate God's word appropriately in the right place, in the right way, to see a life changed by the word of God. So we feed them formally, informally. Secondly, we lead them. Somebody asked me one day, he says, how do you know somebody's a leader? And I pontificated, you know, several great things. He said, well, I got a much easier way to tell. I said, what's that? He said, look behind them. There's nobody there, probably not a leader. If they're a leader, there'll probably be somebody behind them following. That made a lot of sense to me. We lead by example. Elders are told to lead by example. We lead through exhortation. Sometimes we lead through correction. 
But that correction is in keeping with God's word, not our personal opinions, not our preferences about one thing or another. So we lead. We lead by example. We let them watch our lives. And see, that requires a certain amount of getting close to people. That requires a certain amount of opening your doors and opening your windows and, 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 and letting people see your life, letting them hear you at times when you're not guarded. That's the example that we need to be giving as leaders to the flock of God. We also need to meet them. We feed them, we lead them, we meet them. We meet them where they are. That's true both metaphorically and literally. Not where we think they should be. Not always where we wish the sheep were. Sometimes sheep are messy. Sometimes they're in difficult places, nasty places, places that it's not pleasant to go. And sometimes we need to go at times that it's not convenient to go there. Shepherds sometimes get scratched up and bruised getting to their sheep because it's a high calling and sometimes a difficult work. Don't ever think it's easy. So we feed them, we lead them, we meet them, and we protect them. Protecting someone is different from trying to run their life. One of the things Cole used a lot in his teaching and in some of the things he went over with us was a little triad that has stuck with me. I've, I've never forgotten it. It's been very, very helpful in so many different ways of thinking through ministry. Do you remember this? Doctrinal urgency, moral legitimacy, and relational integrity. You remember hearing that? Powerful statements. A, a, an elder, a shepherd, needs to be able to sound the alarms and issue a clear clarion call when matters of essential doctrine are threatened because he protects doctrinal urgency. And they know their members well enough and they're close enough and they have the kind of relationship that they can detect, that they can sniff it out. And they get that sense when, when that member, that sheep is, is wandering from the fold, when they're wandering from truth because they protect moral legitimacy. And they're quick to engage as, as a blessed peacemaker for, for blessed are the peacemakers when relationships are threatened by the schemes of the enemy that want to divide and want to create hate and anger and want to push God's people part of the same one body. They want to push the different members of the body. They want to make the knee and, and the thigh bones separate apart. That never comes out good. That's relational integrity and protecting that. Hey, this can be a messy work sometimes. It can be a messy work, but it's a valuable work and it's a joyful work. Thirdly, shepherds are nurturers, not narcissists. Now, narcissist might be a little strong word, but I needed an in. And so uh, we're going to go with it. But actually, it's not. I'm not saying a person is a narcissist. There's a difference in being a narcissist and demonstrating narcissistic behaviors. And all you need to do is start Googling and blogging some very prominent ministry leaders in the country who over the last couple of years have been asked to step down or have just resigned before they were asked to step down or just straight up fired, not because they had an affair with their secretary, not because they stole money from the church coffers, but because they were bullies, because they treated people like trash because they walked all over one, because you know what they thought? They thought, this is my church, and we'll do things my way here. And they demonstrated those narcissistic behaviors. The elder is never called to that. A shepherd is not a narcissist to his sheep. What is the disposition? What does Peter say the disposition of the shepherd is toward the sheep and toward his shepherding of the sheep? I'm just going to give them to you. We don't really have time to unpack them. But it's not under compulsion, but willingly. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. 
not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. As Paul described his ministry among the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2, just listen, don't you have to look it up right now. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. And elders could say we could have made demands as elders. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother caring for her own children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. That's a shepherd it would not be hard to follow. Men that are ready to share not just the message, but their own lives because people have become so dear to them. There's a benefit to being a member. One of those benefits to being a member is that you are given an elder. You are given an imperfect man to shepherd you. But in the power of the Spirit, we're committed to do that better. In a minute, we're going to talk about what it means to keep watch over someone's soul. It's something we're committing ourselves to be better at and to get better and better and better at. And hopefully over the last week or so, you've all received an email that told you who your elder was. If you didn't, let us know because something's, something's wrong somewhere because you should have. Every member should have received that. And those are relationships that we want to see grow. It's going to take time. It's a process. We're going to make mistakes along the way. It's going to be difficult. But little bit by little bit, step by step, let's work at this. Let's work at creating those healthy shepherding relationships. Let's work at, at creating those healthy nurturing relationships along the way. God has called us as shepherds to the serious business of nurturing, caring for, and loving sheep well. I'm going to ask those of you that are Shepherds that are elders, shepherding elders, if you'll come and just join me on the stairs here. Uh, and then Pastor Jim's going to come and he's going to pray for us. Come on up, guys. Jesus is the perfect example of a true shepherd. And in his word, he outlines what he expects of those who would serve as shepherds of his flock. Uh, some of these words are used interchangeably, but I want to unpack what each of them mean. As an elder, he is a source of wisdom and godly counsel. As an overseer, he feeds, he understands his flock and is watching out for them. As a shepherd, he feeds, cares for, and protects his flock. As a leader, he governs by assessing and promoting what is best. As an equipper, he trains and outfits his flock for growth and effective ministry. As a manager, he's attentive to others in order to actively promote what is in their best interests. He guards the flock. He teaches the truth. He illustrates it by how he lives he has compassion for the weak. He prays for the flock. He serves others true good using what God has given to him. These men <laughs> aspire to do what I've just said. That is no small challenge. <laughs> that is a daunting challenge. In which case, is it even realistic for them to embrace this kind of a task? Paul faced a similar situation, but in the course of it, he revealed a powerful truth. He fulfilled his ministry as an apostle. This is someone who was formerly a murderer, a persecutor of Christians. 
But he fulfilled his ministry as an apostle because of something that he revealed, a grace-based partnership with Father. Here's what he said. This is from Ephesians 3, 7. I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power. In other words, God and I had a grace partnership and that's how I was able to be effective in what I was doing. Well, Paul worked in power. Uh, God worked in power through Paul. Sometimes even using Paul's limitations and weaknesses as a vehicle for what he wanted to do. He said, my grace is sufficient for you even when you hit a brick wall. I'm going to work through you. So, well, what about this group? Do we have anything similar that God has said? And the answer is Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Listen to this. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. In other words, God's power can work within us to accomplish what is fitting for his name, what glorifies him. So it seems very appropriate that we would do something right now, and that is for us to plead with the Lord to work through these men through grace with power to accomplish what glorifies him. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is to stand with me and I'm going to turn and face them and I'm going to pray for them and I'm going to ask God for 10 things. But I'm going to tell you what those 10 things are so that you can be praying with me. We're going to pray for God to give them strength, wisdom, humility, unity, fitting words, those timely words, compassion, boldness, favor, guidance, and a sure hope. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we ask ten things for these men. They have said yes. They are willing to function as shepherds of this flock. And so we would ask first that you would give them strength, that you would supply the energy. When they get a phone call late at night, after a hard day, we pray that you would supply what they need to be able to say, okay, Lord, with your help, I will do this. Father, we pray that they would have wisdom, wisdom drawn from your word that allows them to speak truth and minister encouragement to go, those who are walking through hard times. Father, I pray that you would give them humility, that they would be able to say, it's not about me, it's about God. How can I serve God's interests in the lives of these people? Father, we pray that they would be united, that they would all be working on the same page, that they would have this supernatural oneness which comes from you. You've said that an apt word is like settings of gold, and we want them to have fitting words. We want them to be given the right words to say when it seems like there's nothing that can be said. Father, give them compassion. Help them to have a love for your people. Father, would you make them bold? Help them to not shrink from declaring the whole purpose of God. Surround them with your favor as with a shield. Give them guidance, lead them, direct them. And most of all, give them the sure hope that is informed by 1 Peter 5, 4, which says, having done these things well, and when the sheep, chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Father, we want that to be true of every man standing on this platform, that there comes a day when we stand in your presence and you give to each one of them an unfading crown of glory for having shepherded well the flock entrusted to them. We ask all these things. We dare ask all these things because we ask them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, that's sermon one. So let's move into number two. So we've addressed the fundamental principle of being one body. We've looked at a shepherd and his calling, his role, his heart. Now we turn our attention to the flock that all of us are part of. And remember, shepherds are sheep too. 
Matter of fact, every one of those guys on the platform, every one of those shepherding elders has a shepherding elder. Uh, None of us operate independently. And some are called to shepherd, but all are called to faithfulness and to unity. In a little bit, we're going to recite together and and affirm our membership uh, confession. What I want to do is, biblically speaking, this was like, how do you even begin to take this concept of the the flock, the body, and bring it down? So I I decided just to kind of focus on that membership confession that we're going to be talking about. We're affirming together. And biblically speaking, not going to go through it line by line, but in the big picture, what are we saying in that? What are we saying in that confession that we will say together? One of the things that we're saying is that we all have a part. Every single one of us, there's not a person in this room that knows Jesus Christ that does not have a part. Ephesians 4, back to there again, we read it again, we read it, reiterated again, each part is working, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. When each joint is working together, trust me, I know a little something about joints that are not working. If you know me, you know that story, or those stories. And when joints aren't working, things don't function well. I can promise you that. We've each got a role. We've each got a part. If we, and if we don't do that role, we don't fulfill that part, the growth of the body, the function of the body is impaired. Whether it's a role of leading or whether it's a role of following, whether it's a role that's very public, that's out in front of everybody, or whether it's a role that's very behind the scenes, there are some folks that are, that are making church as we know and understand it happen here every single week that you never see. But without them, man, I don't know what we'd do. They're hiding in little holes around different, different places, doing things that make people at home be able to have that are sick, that are in a hospital room, able to have a good church experience on a Sunday morning that that make us be able to hear things and see things and and sing along with things. There are other people that stand here and proclaim truth or share a testimony or, or talk about a ministry that God is doing and how God is using them and using this church and using others in that ministry. We've all got these roles. The church is not going to thrive until we're all doing it, until we all get a sense that ministry is not something that's just supposed to happen to me. Ministry is something that's supposed to happen through me, that it's supposed to flow through me. It's supposed to be part of something that I am a part of doing, not just a part of receiving. Sure, there are some things we will just receive, but there are also things that we are to do. And ministry is to happen through us, not just to us. God using each of us as his instrument. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians that God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. And with the body of Christ, as the flock, we have responsibility to motivate the motivators. Look at Hebrews 13. Now, I want you to take a deep breath because I don't want anybody to hyperventilate when I read this, okay? Obey your leaders, verse 17, and submit to them. For they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. See, words like obey, words like submit, they tend to set off a lot of alarms. And if we don't trust people, if we don't have trust-based relationships, if we're living in a fear-based culture, then to the very thought of obeying someone else or submitting to someone else just puts us in a frenzy. I want to tell you something. It's what I believe. I don't believe that our members of our session or that our session is always going to be 100% right. Let me tell you what I do believe. I believe they're 100% sincere. And I believe when they're wrong, if they're wrong, and they've admitted to a few things where they were wrong, it wasn't done out of a heart to deceive or a heart to take advantage of. Because I do believe the men that lead this church, and I sit with them often, and I'm not a member of the session, 
But I do believe the men of this church have the heart and the best interest of this flock in mind. And when they do make a mistake, and they are not perfect and never will be, no human being will ever be, it is done out of a heart seeking to do right, not a heart seeking to take advantage or a heart seeking to do wrong. What's the alternative to submission? What's the alternative to, to following leadership? Ecclesiastical chaos. That's the alternative. Every man doing what's right in his own eyes. The last one standing gets his way. The biggest, the most intimidating bully in the crowd wins the day and there's endless strife. And frankly, that's just no way to be a church. That's no way to function. Now listen, I am not talking about blind, mindless, or voiceless following as a flock. Man, say what you think. That's okay. If you disagree with something, speak it. Say it. Say it to the right people. Say it to people who actually can do something with it, not just you know, the phone chain or something. I'm not talking about disobedience to the clear instruction of God's word. I'm not talking about that at all. We'd never expect anyone to do that. But let's face it, most of the time, we're not talking about theological absolutes in a lot of our conflicts. I like to say we're not talking about the steak, we're just talking about the sauce. Because it's usually secondary issues that we get most exercised about. That phrase, keeping watch over your souls, that's an intense phrase. That thing that elders, that shepherds are called to, that is a great privilege for us. Remember I said every shepherd is also a sheep. So this is 100% of us. Remember there's no separate groups. This is 100% of us have someone with the responsibility watching over our souls. Do you understand what a privilege that is? That is not burdensome. That is a place of blessing. That is a place of in, to be encouraged. That is a place to feel secure. That is a place to feel that God has put someone in my life to help me. It's not passive watch care. It is active. It's not just being an observer. It's being proactive and intervening when necessary. That's the job of those shepherds who will give an account to God. Another thing I used to tell my kids when they would get upset because I was being dad, I'd say, look, take it up with God. I'm just doing what he told me to do. Take it up with God. You don't like it, take it up with God. Just trying to be obedient. Now this next line is a little, there's a little difference of opinion about what it means. It says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning. The disagreement among theologians and commentaries is whose joy we're talking about here. My go-to commentaries did not agree with each other on this. Some believe that it's the congregant, it's the joy of the congregant that comes from walking in peace and, and a right relationship with church leaders and, and walking in that submission and obedience. Others believe it's the joy of the leaders uh, whose charges are walking in the truth. And as John says in, in 3 John, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in the truth, my, my favorite verse. The writer of Hebrews says that they must give an account for their watch over your soul. I don't claim to have a definitive answer to which one this is, but here's what I do know. Both biblically and experientially, what our confession says when we pursue peace and unity in the church, when we strive to live as disciples of Jesus in this present age, shepherds will find great joy in that. And the flock will find great advantage and blessing from the Lord as we serve him together in unity and as we grow together. The shepherds, flock, the whole body together benefits in that. And lastly, to spur, stir, and stimulate. That's really all the same word. It's just three different ways that it's translated. The ESV says, let us consider, in, in Hebrews 10, let us consider how to stir up. The NIV says, let us consider how to spur. The New American Standard says, let us consider how to stimulate. 
I love all three of those words. I love all three of them t- together. How to stimulate one another to love and good works. Not, to, not neglecting to meet together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's a good time to be reminded that we're never designed by God to do this alone. You are not designed to do the Christian walk, to do the Christian life in isolation. We don't have what we need to do that. We were created for connection. We created to be spurred on, to be stirred up, to be stimulated by others in the body of Christ. Our Christianity was designed to work within the context of a body of believers where we, as the confession in a moment will say, consistently celebrate together through joyful worship, generously contribute our time, resources, gifts, and abilities to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly in word and deed and encourage and exhort one another with the truth of God's word. Listen, I need you in my business. And whether you like it or not, you need me in your business. We need one another in our business. Because let me tell you, one of the ways that, one of the things that you need to watch for with friends and brothers and sisters in Christ is when they begin to isolate. When they begin to isolate, when they begin to pull away from the body, when they begin to pull away from fellowship, when they begin to put themselves in isolation away from God's people, That's a real danger sign. We're supposed to be doing this together, the good, the bad, the ugly. I can't tell you how many people through the years I've heard say here, I thought I was the only one. I thought I was the only one. Whatever they were doing, I didn't think anybody else was dealing with this. I'm going to tell you a quick story. A while back, there was a young couple, not at this church, who were in a marriage crisis because of unfaithfulness in the marriage. And they worked through it. They, they hung in there, and they are working through it, hanging in there, working through it. I got a note from them this week. They said, hey, I just wanted you to know, we're meeting with a couple that's currently separated because we want to help them work through it too. We want to be there for them. That's the way this is supposed to work. That's the way this is supposed to work, is that we're supposed to be there for when we go through things that are hard. I just talked to somebody earlier today who's gone through an experience that somebody else is going through. And I said, hey, I hope you don't mind, but I told this person to contact you. I told them to contact you because you, you have insight into what they're living right now because you've lived that. You've been through that. We're not supposed to be doing this by ourselves. We're not supposed to be doing this in isolation. And we've got to learn more and more and more that it's okay to be honest. And it's okay to pull off the mask. And it's okay to say, man, I am struggling. I'm angry. I'm hurt. I'm sad. I'm tempted. We need to learn to practice more interventional than confessional accountability so that we can intervene before the sin occurs rather than just confessing to one another. Our membership covenant says this. Having been led by the Spirit of God through the Word of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, we do now confess as one body in Christ and as members of First Evangelical Church, we will strive to live as disciples of Jesus in this present age. We will consistently celebrate together through joyful worship. We will generously contribute our time, resources, gifts, and abilities to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly in both word and deed. And we will pursue peace and unity in the church, encouraging and exhorting one another with the truth of God's word to the glory of God and for the edification of his people. If you will affirm that confession, I'm going to ask you to stand and to read that aloud now on the screen. And then after that, Kevin is going to come and pray for us. And then I'm going to introduce some new members. So let's read together. Having been led by the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, we do now confess as one body in Christ and as members of First Evangelical Church 
We will strive to live as disciples of Jesus in this present age. We will consistently celebrate together through joyful worship. We will generously contribute our time, resources, gifts, and abilities to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly in both word and deed. And we will pursue peace and unity in the church, encouraging and exhorting one another with the truth of God's word to the glory of God and for the edification of his people. Kevin, come pray for us, please. Good morning, First of Ann. A number of years ago, uh, my mother-in-law's son, or Stanley, uh, put Sean and I on the uh, prayers of the Puritans and the beauty of those prayers. And this morning, I'd like to pray one of those prayers for all of us. Uh, and it revolves around what Taylor was talking about, the privilege the privileges we have in Christ and being believers. And so let's pray. Oh Lord God, teach us to know that grace precedes, accompanies, and follows our salvation, that it sustains the redeemed soul, that not one link of its chain can ever break. From Calvary's cross, wave upon wave of grace reaches us, deals with our sin, washes us clean, renews our heart, strengthens our will, draws our affection, kindles the flame in our soul, rules throughout our inner man, consecrates our every thought, word, work, teaches us thy immeasurable love. How great are our privileges in Christ Jesus. Without him, we stand far off, a stranger and outcast. In him, we draw near and touch his kingly scepter. Without him, we dare not lift our guilty eyes. In him, we gaze upon our Father God. Without him, we hide our lips in trembling shame. In him, we open our mouth in petition and praise. Without him, all is wrath and consuming fire. In him is all love and the repose of our soul. Praise be to thee for grace and for the unspeakable gift of Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Take a seat, one more second. These messages were intended to be aspirational. These are what we aspire to. And the thing that will shut it all down faster than anything else is a lack of grace. You've heard the expression, no guts, no glory. Well, no grace, no glory. Because all we will be is in conflict and all we will be is judging one another about how well you did this, how well you did that, you did good, you did bad. And that's not what it's about. It's not about good or bad. It's about are we learning? Are we growing? Are we taking the next step? Are we coming a little more like Jesus? day by day. That's what this ultimately comes down to. Hey, I want to introduce some new folks to you. You're going to see their pictures up on the screen. And uh, be sure you, you just take the opportunity to greet them. Don't forget, we do have the new member luncheon. And uh, even if you are, uh, have not recently joined, but you're interested in membership, you're welcome to come to that. Let me introduce these folks to you. First is Luke Haltry. Here's Luke. Jordan and Sarah Carroll. Elizabeth Collier, Dave and Ashley Garner, Cliff and Linda Riley, Doug and Terry Barnes, David and Cynthia Johnson, Ryan and Lauren Johnson. Phil and, and Kate Taylor, and a lot of you will recognize Kate as our preschool director. Allie Williams, and Sam and Sarah Caitlin Wilcox. 
There are quite a few others that are in the process that haven't quite finished yet. I think some were even done this morning. I think you said there were some, some uh, people that finished the process this morning but didn't make this. We'll recognize them at a little later date. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that we are one body. And together we celebrate you. Together we serve you. Together we care for one another. We're grateful you've given us leaders. We're grateful you've given us a ministry in Christ Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen. Let's sing. We've been brought together as shepherds and sheep so that God can work through us in the world and add to our fold. We work hard at unity so that we can be a shining light to others. Let's stand and ask God to use us to lift Jesus' name high in our city and around the world.
you have any questions from today's teaching or you have anyone you'd really love to talk to, we have a cross back here and we have people who will be stationed back there. We'd love to be able to talk to you about salvation and what it looks like to be shepherded. Uh, go now in God's grace.